Hello, my name is Zach Jenkins. I'm an associate professor of pharmacy practice and a clinical specialist in infectious diseases. This past week, remdesivir made waves through society as it influenced the dialogues in the world of medicine, politics, and economics. But is remdesivir all it's cracked up to be in the fight against COVID-19? We'll be discussing that today. On the 29th of April, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is a division of the National Institute of Health, issued a statement indicating that remdesivir had shown early success against COVID-19. Specifically, it showed that it accelerated recovery, patients, recovery for patients with severe disease. But remdesivir is not a new product to us. In fact, we were trialing it against other types of coronaviruses in the past decade. decade. So we looked at it against Ebola, we looked, at, we looked at it against SARS, we looked at it against MERS. And what they ended up theorizing based on laboratory analyses is that it inhibited an enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, if you've been following this video series at all, you may, you may remember from a few weeks ago, we discussed hydroxychloroquine, and that's one of the targets that's been proposed for that particular drug. So as a quick review, we know that when the coronavirus enters a cell, it causes genetic data to be dumped off, which ends up triggering RNA polymerase to make copies of it, to photocopy it, if you will, and that makes more RNA, more genetic data of the virus, which then causes more proteins, more structural elements, et cetera, to be made, and thus makes more virus. So the thought would be, what if we could stop that enzyme, that RNA polymerase, from functioning? That would lead to a decrease in viral replication. Well, that's exactly what the thought is behind remdesivir. So it actually jams the process, so to speak. It jams the copier, which leads to a decrease in overall viral synthesis. So this means for, for patients, we could potentially decrease all viral production down the road, and, and that kind of is a, is a hopeful consideration. Now, now, why we're even thinking about this drug at this point in time, what had happened with remdesivir and why it never really made it to market is it actually was halted in phase two trials against Ebola. So phase one and phase two clinical trials are there for safety, and it goes from smaller populations of patients to larger populations. And if safety issues are observed, they can actually halt trials at that point. Now with the Ebola virus, what they ended up finding is that there was a higher incidence and mortality for patients that were on this particular drug versus the other compounds that they tested. And so they ended up halting that trial early. There were limitations with that particular study, but even so, people were nervous about using it. The good news for us in the fight against COVID-19, though, is because it had gone through safety trials and they thought the mortality issues were due to Ebola and not to the drug itself, we were able to enter directly into phase three trials with remdesivir against COVID-19. And so phase three trials are where we look at not just safety, but also efficacy using a much larger sample size. So that's kind of where we were with remdesivir. Now, in light of that, there's been a lot of investigation going on. Specifically, there was a case series that was published um, er earlier last month that, that really showed um, 53 patients being looked at who had received remdesivir for something called compassionate use. And, and what happened in this group is that about 68% of them showed a positive benefit from this therapy in general. Um, but unfortunately, this was not a controlled trial. This was something where they're just reporting findings, anecdotal findings. And there wasn't really follow-up for about a third of all the patients that were included. So we don't know what their ultimate outcomes were. Another limitation here is they actually included patients who were up to 12 days already into their illness. And it would probably go without saying that the earlier we could treat, the more optimal our outcomes might be. There was another trial that was recently published um, that was performed in China, and this actually was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multi-center trial. And, and what happened in this case is they were not able to enroll as many patients as they felt they needed to prove some kind of statistical significance. Uh, they only ended up including 237 patients, but because China had actually quashed a lot of the cases of coronavirus, they didn't have enough of a sample to work with. And so how that may have influenced findings, what they looked at was how long it took patients to recover and what the overall mortality was. And they found that there was no statistically significant differences in either of those cases. Uh, there's some trend towards a decrease in time to recovery, um, but those were some limitations in this case. Another problem is that there was a wide range of patients who were treated um, further into their illness. And as I mentioned before, the earlier we could treat, the likely the outcomes, um, the, the likely the better outcomes we would see. More recently, there was the evidence that was shared from the ACT trial. 
Now this trial is the one that we've been looking at through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and this is what that preliminary data was shared from. This, this trial itself was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial, which means that it's, it's a pretty reliable trial, just like that, that Chinese trial potentially was. But the difference here is there was a much larger sample size included. And another difference is they actually included uh, patients potentially um, earlier into their disease process. When they looked at this particular study, they ended up halting it early because they saw positive outcomes from the drug. Now we're going to get into that, whether that's normal or not here in just a moment. But another consideration here is these results were shared early and they haven't gone through a peer review process, so there could be some potential bias as well. The outcomes that they found, though, was that in patients that had remdesivir versus placebo, they had a time to recovery. It was about a 31% improvement, and that was found to be statistically significant. When they looked at mortality, it was trending towards significance, meaning that it looked good, but the stats didn't necessarily back it up with 100% certainty. Um, and the thought here is maybe because the trial was halted early, they didn't have enough patients to observe that outcome. Now when we break down how many patients might necessarily be needed to treat before we could see that decrease in length of, of uh, recovery, it, it's about 28 patients for every one poor outcome that we would prevent, which is actually as far as numbers that we would need to treat go, fairly decent. So that speaks well to the future of this particular product. The trial itself, if you're interested in the protocol, can be, find on clinical, can be found on clinicaltrials.gov, but you'll see this initially started in February, and according to the protocol, what they indicated is that they had set up an independent, an independent data and safety monitoring board. So this is independent from the researchers, people that are looking at this with no potential for bias here. And, and this is normal for studies that are, that are of this size, and their goal is, of course, to make sure that trials are safe for patients involved in the trial, and that they observe issues early in the trial when they do preliminary analyses, they'll stop the trial in, in fear of harming patients. The other thing that happens is if, is if they observe positive outcomes, they will sometimes also stop the trial because it would be unethical if there's no other care option available to treat something, to treat someone with something that's inferior. And that's exactly what happened in this case. They found that because we have no other treatment option, um, really not treating with remdesivir was inferior, than treating, inferior to treating with remdesivir. So this actually prompted Dr. Fauci after several different calls with investigators involved in this trial to actually share this information early. And according to him, one particular reason was the ethical obligation to patients who had been taking placebos. He wanted to make sure that people knew this drug had shown a shorter recovery time and could thus potentially be considered some kind of standard of care. He did indicate at this time that it, however, had not been peer reviewed and so that does warrant some consideration. And he also made sure to emphasize that while there was a trend towards a mortality difference, we can't say with certainty that it was a statistically significant trend. When we look at uh, what happened in the aftermath of this, there was an article that actually came out talking about how the researchers had changed the metric, the thing they're using to measure um, this particular outcome. And according to what they said, uh, what had happened is they changed from mortality being the big thing they were looking for to instead being time to recovery. Now, according to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the reason behind their decision was early on, as we learned about COVID-19, we thought that recovery time was shorter, so about two weeks. But as we've gotten further into this, we've discovered that some patients with severe disease take much longer to recover. In fact, up to 21 to 28 days in cases. And so they felt that looking at time to recovery would be a more substantial impact at that point. So that's why they looked at that as their primary outcome. But even so, this actually caused the FDA to issue an emergency use authorization for remdesivir. And according to the FDA, they did it in light of the fact that there's no adequate, no approved, no other available alternative treatment with data to really back it up um, that really would outweigh um, the, the, the risks involved with using those other therapies. So they felt remdesivir's use, the benefits of it outweigh the risks, and they felt comfortable moving forward saying this could be a potential product. Now they haven't given it formal approval because it still need to go, it needs to go through that process, but what this does is it opens up the ability to use this drug for different purposes. But the short of this, and why this, is, was, this was so important, this is the first large-scale study that was well-designed that seemed to show a positive benefit to these investigational therapies. Most other data out there, if we look at hydroxychloroquine, for example, um, there's, there's data that says maybe there's a benefit, but unfortunately the problem with some of that data is 
it's all single arm. There's no control. They're not peer-reviewed studies, so they're less reliable and potentially have more bias in them. Looking specifically at uh, these particular classifications, compassionate use itself, um, that was what remdesivir was initially reserved for. And what that meant is you could only get this outside of a trial if you were pregnant or if you were a child and you had severe COVID-19 because there was no other therapeutic alternative for you. What this has done though with this emergency use authorization is that means any patient with severe disease and they define what those parameters are can potentially get this product independent of any ongoing trials. There are still a number of trials under underway right now. There is of course the one that we've talked about from the United States, but there are several being done uh, internationally, one through the World Health Organization, and two are directly from the pharmaceutical company involved with this product. The pros behind remdesivir at this point seem to be that it will decrease the length of the illness, similar to what Tamiflu might do in patients, and we do use that in the ICU setting as an example. There's also a trend towards decreased mortality. Um, we can't say again for sure that that's actually proven. And there seem to be uh, no drug interactions and few toxicities that we're aware of. The most notable toxicity is potentially in patients with a risk of liver injury. Um, this might contribute to that. It could cause something called transaminitis, which is where we alter how many liver enzymes are circulating in, in your body. So we're not sure how that might play out, but by and large, it seems well tolerated. Um, the uh, issues that we run into beyond that, though, is it's an IV only product. There's no oral formulation. Uh, right now, you can only get it if you have severe cases of the illness it's likely going to be costly when it ends up hitting the market because it is a new product. And patients who had kidney disease were actually excluded from these trials. And since this drug does get eliminated through the kidney, it gets um, sent out of your body through the kidney, we can't say for certain how patients with kidney impairments might actually fare. This also breeds uh, some other considerations up, one of which is what other research opportunities may th might there be? Well, now we can, we can look at things like, well, what does remdesivir versus, do versus other endpoints? So versus mortality, versus disease complications like lung damage, like blood clots. What does it do against other treatments that we're looking at as well? Does time really play a critical role in, in when we use remdesivir? And how do combinations of remdesivir with other products work? Like what would happen if we combined it with hydroxychloroquine? How would that bear against patients who just had remdesivir by itself? Other benefits beyond this, now that we have something we can kind of consider a standard of care, um, one, one thing to think about is that means patients can actually stay in the hospital less time. So that, that means they can have a recovery from illness more quickly and go home more quickly, meaning they can get back to life as normal with their family and potentially back to work. So there's that socioeconomic consideration. Another thought is it frees up healthcare resources because you can free up hospital beds if they're needed by getting the patient out the door more quickly. So there are a lot of benefits to consider with remdesivir, but really where that still leads us is we still need to continue to investigate these things and it'll be interesting to see what peer review of that data ultimately shows.